The Huron and the Algonquin called it Ashtaku. The French equivalent was Chaudière. Whatever the language, the meaning was the same, a boiling kettle, a cauldron of water spewing forth from the interior. Around those falls in the Ottawa River was a portage for Brulé, Champlain, the missionaries, the voyageurs, a parade of characters from Canada's past, traveling for the cause of furs, religion, a new route to the Orient. And then there was that remarkable and complex man, Philemon Wright. He was described by a contemporary as about six feet high, a tight man with a wonderfully strange, quick, reflective, wide eye. At the age of 39, Wright recognized the potential of the land and the timber and the power of the Chaudière, and he set out to realize a vision. We'll trace the story of Wright, who was to become known as the father of the Ottawa, and of Wright's town, which was to become the present-day city of Hull in the province of Quebec. The Parliament buildings. Perched on the limestone cliffs above the Ottawa River, a constant in the landscape for over a century. For the city on the other side, the too often used cliche referring to Hull, the view is etched in its psyche. At times through history, the river separating this city from the nation's capital may as well have been an ocean, but things are changing. Hull's inner core has been rebuilt in recent years to accommodate modernism and an expanded economy. The federal government, working with municipal leaders, has chosen the site for an array of office complexes to house its civil service. Brewery Creek, the Gatineau, and Ottawa Rivers surround the city. Hull is an island. In the forefront of recent arrivals, the Canadian Museum of Civilization. Projected against the backdrop of the Gatineau Hills, the structure hugs the North Shore as if carved from the old rock of the shield itself. The island of Hull is set like a theater. While the new has become the principal actor taking center stage, the old quietly awaits its opportunity. Here, behind the curtain backstage, is the main character of our story. This is the place that was constructed of courage, the town built on perseverance and plain hard work. This is the neighborhood whose vocabulary didn't know the word couldn't. Here is the soul of the hall of yesterday. Denise Latramoy has studied the social history. The whole story is the story of a family and of the company town. The Wright family occupied the, the town for most of the 19th century, being the landowner, the principal landowner. They owned a third of the township. And they gave this the town the visual aspect it still has now. This collection of working family homes has survived many influences, natural and man-made. Incidents in both its distant and recent past have all played a role in the shaping of the hall of today. In fact, its history is still very much unfolding. As a journalist, Jean Bellot has tracked much of the story. The movement of all these government buildings is kind of a new phenomenon. And I have the impression that they're just sort of planted there. What kind of in impact has that had on the city and on the people who live here? In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, every politician in here was saying, we need federal buildings in Hull. Finally, the federal government came in. But unfortunately, the way it was 
planted, like you say, in the hull. It, that's a very nice word. It, it destroyed the, the, the social uh, the, 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 the social fiber of the, of, the old, of the island of Hull. Well, I'm not so sure that it's been destroyed because I can walk a block from the big government building or one of the big hotels here, and I'm in what seems like the old part of Hull. Yes, definitely, yes. Well, the people who still live there, the people who survived, the people who were able to relocate themselves, and they're sure they're not going to give up that because that's, that's their social fiber, that's their reason to be. But the changes have been great. Uh, there's a saying that goes that uh, Hull is a lucky city in the sense that it has 15,000 tourists that come in at 8.30 in the morning and leave at quarter to five every day, <laughs> five days a week, <laughs> and, uh, and it's the case. You know. Now is a time for adjustment. Those whose place of business hall now is are gradually coming to know those whose home it has always been. Between the two, a synthesis is taking hold. The gap that has traditionally existed between the cities of Hull and Ottawa ironically had much to do with the earliest and main orchestrator on the scene. He arrived in 1799 with a group of 40 people from New England. Early on, his land acquisitions suggested the title of Squire Wright, and the squire was out to create a fiefdom. Pierre-Louis Lepoint, author and historian. Up to 1806, things went relatively well. You know, he built a small sawmill, a gristmill, and this kind of thing. But uh, finally, uh, he started lacking capital, and he had to have a kind of a cash crop to bring in money. He knew that there was a ready market for North American timber. So he built the first raft, he baptized it the Colombo, and they started off from the outskirts of Hull here close to Point Gatineau, and they descended the Ottawa River. It took them about two months to bring this enormous raft of lumber and timber down to Quebec City. And Quebec City at that time was the metropolis of Canada, termed commercial-wise. Wright's product had found its place. Within a decade, Le Chaudier would explode into the brawling era of the lumbermen. The frontier of the Ottawa became a Klondike. The wood trade there was quite dangerous. Uh, people would actually float the cribs on the river and hope for the best when they would come uh, to the falls. But uh, there were lots of people drowned. And the only safety measure they could have, for instance, is having the priests say masses. The Wild West of the Chaudière was nearly 30 years old at the time Colonel Bai arrived to dig his ditch, the Rideau Canal. In mid-century, the towns named after Bai and Wright rivaled each other. In the 1840s, uh, Ottawa was a real dangerous place. You had all the raft men coming down the rivers in the spring and uh, spending the to be polite, the upsurge of energy that they had gathered all winter long. Uh, and the priests were very uh, upset at that. They, they saw the risk for the morality of the young people, of the 19, 18 year old people coming out from Quebec's farm and dropping by, by in these uh, places of evil. Uh, so the priest uh, insisted upon having a parish on this side of the river to gather the young men. That's how the small chapel here was built in 1845. The town was getting its foothold. The Union Bridge built at the falls became the foundation for expanded enterprise. But the little North Shore community had been dealt a weak hand. The site of the city of Hull did not develop as fast as it should have because the Wright family continued to control most of the land inside the city proper, the city limits proper. And they refused to sell that land. They preferred renting it, which means that people who would want to invest and build, for instance, uh, a sawmill, they would have to build it on rented land. So no sane capitalist would have done so at the time. The gap was set. The weight on the industrial teeter-totter was on the side of Bytown. For Hull, its future, needed a release from the right stranglehold. In the meantime, lumber equated to jobs, and jobs meant opportunity. In they came, people looking to set down roots, no matter what. The influx of workers from the Montreal area 
will have an impact on the general coloring of the population because up to 1856 in the Hull village and overall the Hull township area, it was a majority English speaking area, uh, very much so. And uh, it's only in 1856 in the village that the village became majority French speaking. The population the was multiplied by three, from 3,000 to 11,000 within 10 years. So it, there's a big uh, boost of population within these 10 years. And they rented little lots of land from the rights on which they would build a little house. Now, this is one of the interesting characteristics of Hull, is the fact that the rights, in order to make more money renting these lots, instead of renting generally 66 feet wide lots, city lots, they would rent half lots, 33 feet wide, which means that people who want to build a house on that size lot, they had to keep at least an entrance that would make it possible for them to bring their buggy to the back in the backyard kind of thing. So it made it impossible to build a house uh, wider than about 20 feet at the most, sometimes 18 feet wide. So that it made for these very special looking houses, thin two and three story houses, and extending out in the backyard. So that on some of the old old streets, we still have remains, remnants of that kind of architecture. For the established settlement on the original site, there would be hope at last. In the middle of the 1800s, the town would welcome a new player who would become their hero and benefactor, leading it into an age of success. The latter half of the 19th century, Eyes were focused on the changing scene at the Chaudière. What we see today is but a fraction of the industrial complex that rocketed the community overnight into world markets. The main thoroughfares rang with prosperity within a few years of the arrival of a second New England entrepreneur. This one would shed the old name of Wrightstown and bring in the new, Hull, after the township. E.B. Eddy was the main character from the middle of the 19th century to the end. He was a mayor, he was a member of parliament, and he was the principal employer of the town. E.B. Eddy came to Hull in, in, in 1852, and he started making matches, you know, these hand matches. They were almost explosive, dangerous devices. I mean, when you, you, you lit one, there was so much smoke that uh, they, they even called some of them Lucifer matches. I mean, they, they were terrible things. Of course, he had a big impact uh, on, on the whole history of Hull. Uh, I guess it's 2,000 people. Uh, at the end of the century, his uh, trade kept busy. The building of this match industry, I mean, became so important in Hull. So many women and people were working in this industry that Hull was very proud of thinking of itself as the match capital of the world. The match capital ran at its peak. It gained the stability it was looking for, the Eddy Empire gradually extinguishing the Wright Dynasty. Pulp and paper and other industries, cement, meat processing, foundries, joined the economic bonanza. But as always, a price was paid. The wail of the factory whistle sounded its cry throughout the Dickens-like neighborhood. Hull was an industrial town. People with low wages, long hours, it was a hard-working town. It's only in 1895 that uh, the day work was brought down to 10 hours. It, people used to work from six, day, 6 in the morning to 6 at night. Uh, you had children working in the sawmills. It was a grim picture. Life was simply tough. Early labor movements arose, solidarity against working conditions. Families, neighbors, stuck by one another. Their way of life mirrored in their very homes. The main activity of the town being centered on wood. Most houses were built of wood. 
People would gather at the base of their house with whatever beams they, they would find, and that would be the structure, and, and that's it. Uh, no basement, and uh, they'd build high to have uh, more room since they had such small lots. If you look at Jean Lee's uh, paintings, for instance, you still find that. Captured on canvas is a peek into what citizens today refer to as Le Vieux Hall, the old city. This is the old part of Hall. And uh, for a painter, this is uh, what's interesting, you know, because the new, uh, the new buildings are, are not much for a painter, I guess. <laughs> not for me, anyway. Jean Ali is part of a special brand of culture that this community has fostered. Yeah. Following in the path of others, like internationally known painter Jean Delaire, Ali interprets from memory the place of his boyhood. A walk through the old town is to take the road to nostalgia. Before the changes that modernism brought, horrific fires had taken their toll. Those of the 1800s, though, would never compare to the inferno at the end of the century. In 1900, it's a catastrophe. Because the, the old city of Hull, the other, the other four-fifths of the town, or the other three-quarters of the town that hadn't burned down in 1888, burnt down in 1900, in the spring of 1900. So that the fire, uh, fanned by high winds, started in the morning in part of Hull, and the flames were swept towards Ottawa, across the lumber piles, and I mean it burnt three-quarters to four-fifths of the city of Hull, and it also burnt about one-fifth of the city of Ottawa, which means that all of the original buildings, stone buildings, uh, brick houses, whatever was the old center of old Wrightstown, disappeared into ashes. totally rebuild the town, which they did so in about six months to a year and a half. I mean, this tenacity, this, this very, uh, this will to survive as a community, I mean, they had to have those guts, in, you know, in those days. Most of their population was uh, without any building. They had, they had to build camps and tents uh, on the flats there uh, across the river and then they rebuilt, and this is why, not so many years ago, you could still see those houses with large wooden planks, you know, like yes. this. The company had given them that to, the, to its employees so they could rebuild their house to come and live there, and the people had used that, and they would never paint them and never fix them, because at that time, if you painted your house, your taxes would go up, so people would fix the inside of their house very nicely, but they would, they wouldn't, they would bother with the outside. A supporter of today's restoration movement in the old quarter is Raymond Wimet, who spends time working with his neighbors toward a common goal. Most of the houses you find on this street were built uh, right after the uh, Grand Fleur of 1900. Those houses will be uh, protected the next uh, year by a new rule to try to help people to remember how the city used to look at one time. That doesn't mean that you cannot uh, still continue to build new things. But I think that uh, it is important to remember what people did before us. It is by visiting people like senior resident Monsieur Perron that we met is able to piece together the complete story of the buildings. Monsieur Perron tells him of growing up in this house and remembering the legendary mill owners, like J.R. Booth, who benefited the city. And so, hidden behind the curtain, waiting in the wings, the reality, the story of the town that is,
On the streets today, a spirit of renaissance, with one thing for sure. The community has always been resilient, prepared to meet the future head on. Old town embracing new town, and vice versa. Because it was an industrial town, it had a tendency of uh, being downplayed by people who had white collar jobs or blue collar jobs in, in uh, the capital city of Canada. But there's something very important to notice is that Hull, even if it was close to the capital city, has always managed to keep its own form of culture mm -hmm. and uh, its own uh, uh, way of living. Our ancestors in Hull, our people in Hull, worked very hard to build what they, what they could and, and, and uh, really made great strides. We have a responsibility, to, uh, responsibility too to the young who follow us. What kind of town we will, will we leave them? Uh, just buildings or a place where it's nice to live in? The people we have met, Denise, Pierre-Louis, Raymond, Jean-Eli, Jean Bello, Jean exemplify the heart of this place. They are a part of the story, and knowing them tells me it will succeed. Paul's history is unfolding. The city of Hall began with the lumbermen, then went on to become an industrial center. It always had a spirit, a kind of a rough and ready frontier atmosphere. And if you visit here today, you get the feeling it's still not very far from that. Government, the civil service, they're here, but not really a part of it. That'll take another couple of generations. Despite the overpowering shadow of the parliament buildings just across the river, the city of Hall is unique with a style and distinction that's all its own. Whenever I go, whenever I do that place, I know.